Okay, can you see my slide? Okay. Yeah, looks great. Yes. Okay. Um. All right. Uh. First of all, thanks the organizers for giving me this great opportunity to present uh, our work here. Um. Today, I would like to share our study on the structure and dynamics of nucleosomes with different uh, DNA sequences and uh, histone modifications. Um. So uh, a brief introduction here, uh, in eukary eukaryotic cells, um, the DNA wrapped around the uh, uh, histone octomer uh, forms the nucleosome core particles, which is NCP in short. Uh, NCP uh, interacts with the linker histones and linker DNA to form high order structure of chromatin. Uh, so the activity of DNA is precisely uh, regulated by many factors, uh, such as uh, binding proteins, remodelers, post-translational modifications, etc. Uh, so over over the last several decades, uh, the mechanism of how DNA activity is regulated uh, largely studied. However, there are still many questions remain uh, to be answered. Uh, so in our study, we're trying to understand the mechanism, mechanisms of DNA regulation through studying the interaction between nucleosomes with the uh, uh, regulation factors. So typically, uh, uh, we're using uh, solution, either solution state and NMR or solid state NMR to look at the uh, nucleosome systems. So normally in our uh, sample, we have one of the histones, which is uh, isotope labeled, and we're using uh, uh, the isotope labeled histone and unlabeled uh, histone or uh, DNA uh, to uh, reconstitute uh, nucleosome arrays in vitro or nucleosome core particles. And with or without the presence of binding factors, we can look at the uh, uh, structure and dynamics and the interaction between the uh, uh, different component uh, uh, using a uh, solid state or solution state NMR. So for such a uh, system, we typically, typically can uh, using a uh, dipolar based experiment to look at the mole molecular property for the histone glo globular domains in the nucleosome. And we can also use g cardboard experiment to look at the uh, highly flexible and terminal tails in the system. Uh, so far, we have been able to uh, get the full assignment of histone H4 and H3 in the nucleosome uh, system. And the uh, structure, the secondary structure derived from the chemical shape uh, indicate, indicate that the histones uh, form, fold into the uh, same uh, uh, structure as in uh, uh, X, uh, uh, XRD crystals. Uh, so the uh, I highlight here the system we studying and uh, using NMR is uh, uh, a nucleosome uh, that present in near uh, in a condition close to physiological condition. Um, so uh, when we look at the biological activities of chromatin. Uh, many times we, we realize that the structure alone cannot fully explain the uh, uh, chromatin activities in vivo. Uh, for instance, post-translation translational modifications is one of the uh, key uh, regulation mechanism in epigenetics. Uh, recently, there's many sites uh, located at the uh, uh, histone cause uh, observed to having uh, modifications. And those sites typically, uh, uh, those sites are located uh, far away from the uh, DNA site that it regulate. And uh, the modification occur at those sites typically only introduce local conformational uh, changes, which cannot explain the changes in uh, biological activities. Uh, so therefore we think the dynamics also play a role here. So we went ahead to look at the uh, histone dynamics in nucleosomes at a different time scale. Uh, the first time scale we look at is the microsecond to nanosecond time scale. And here's the uh, two example we, uh, uh, of uh, histone H3 and H4 order parameters that we measured for uh, nucleosome core particles. 
And the data shows that um, uh, there's no large difference across uh, the majority of the histone proteins, which indicates the uh, uh, uniformly compact packing of the residues in the uh, very well ordered NCP call. And there's a, a, a few uh, domains such as the uh, histone uh, H4C terminal, which exhibit uh, relatively larger amplitude motions in this time scale. Um, the next time scale we look at is the uh, uh, millisecond to microsecond time scale. So uh, we obtained the uh, qualitative measurement uh, of uh, motions in this time scale using the peak intensities in the dipolar based experiment. And from the uh, peak intensities, we can uh, we, we 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 can see that there are many regions that shows higher uh, uh, mobility in this time scale, and those uh, those regions tend to overlap with the uh, residues that link to functional response to modifications or mutations. Uh, for instance, the histone uh, H3 alpha N, which we show. Uh, we, we show that it has a high, uh, uh, relative higher mobility in this time scale. And uh, this domain uh, was previously shows uh, um, uh, that it is critical in the uh, DNA unwrapping and the sliding uh, activities. So when we summarize the uh, time scale in the millisecond to microsecond time scale uh, for these two histone proteins in nucleosome, we immediately notice uh, some interesting phenomena here. Uh, so first of all, the residues, which shows uh, uh, enhanced mobility in this time scale, they tend to form dynamic networks. Uh, those networks extended from the histone core regions through a certain pathway all the way uh, to the remote DNA site. And we think that this dynamic network actually serve as a pathway which can uh, transmit the epigenetic signals that occur at the core region uh, to the remote DNA site, therefore regulate the remote DNA activity, uh, which is a mechanism analog to allosteric regulation. Uh, so we think such allosteric regulation probably a, a common uh, a regulation uh, mechanism in uh, chromosome uh, chromatin activity. So uh, uh, binding uh, 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 molecular property changes occur uh, through certain regulation uh, re regulate regulation factors uh, can uh, changing the uh, property at the downstream, therefore changing the activity at the downstream side. Uh, so a second, uh, another system I'm talking about here is the telomeric nucleosome. Um, Telomere locate at the uh, uh, very end of chromosome. It is very critical in the uh, maintain the integrity and stability of chromosome. And it is also very unstable, prone to DNA damage. Uh, so last year, one of our colleagues solved the crystal structure of the telomeric uh, NCP. And it shows that it has nearly identical structure as the 601 NCP. However, we all know that telomere has very different uh, uh, biological, uh, sorry, biophysical uh, property compared to uh, nucleosome having other uh, DNA sequence. For instance, here shows the diagram of the formation energy where tel telomere has very high uh, formation energy and 601 on the other hand has very low formation energy. So the structure uh, here cannot explain the bio physical property difference uh, uh, in the uh, telomeric nucleosome. So we, there, we therefore uh, went ahead to look at the telomeric NCP at a condition closer to physiological condition. Uh, so the first set of experiment we did is to look at the histone tails in the telomeric NCP. And we compared to the model uh, uh, 601, uh, rhythm 601 telomeric, we do observe conformational changes in the histone H3 tails and H4 tails. However, those uh, uh, conformational uh, changes are quite small. And we also observe that the, uh, the histone tails tend to be more dynamic in the telomeric NCP. 
And uh, we also uh, uh, performed the dipolar uh, based experiment looking at the globular domain of the histone uh, cause in the nucleosome. And the data shows that, again, there's a, a minor local conform conformational changes occur in the uh, 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 core regions in the telomeric NCP compared to radium 601 NCP. Uh, so then the, uh, when we look at the uh, dynamic property in the microsecond to millisecond dynamics, it actually shows, shows some interesting uh, information here. Uh, so we, uh, with the uh, qualitative measurement of the motions in this time scale, we observe many residues in the telomeric NCP shows enhanced mobility. And interestingly, those residues actually locate as the dynamic network that we previously identified or the neighbor regions. So overall, the study on the telomeric NCP uh, indicates that the uh, histones in the telomere fold into the same structure as in the Vietnam 601 NCP, and their minor local conformational changes happened built both the core region, uh, core region and the uh, histone tails. And uh, the enhanced dynamics are observed for the N-terminal uh, tail regions and also the globular regions. And uh, those regions are uh, overlap with the uh, dynamic network that we previously identified. So therefore, uh, this study also uh, further verified that the dynamic network that we uh, identified previously does actually indeed couple DNA with the, uh, with the call, uh, histone core regions. So the last system I would like to show here is the uh, nucleosome that harbors the histones with the post-translational modifications. Uh, so post-translational modification is a very critical uh, in DNA activity regulation. And uh, recently, one of, uh, one, one of our collaborator, uh, collaborators, they, uh, they show that um, the uh, modification uh, methylation occur at the histone H4K20 site uh, has a, a very unique uh, uh, abundance at different uh, re uh, gene regions. Uh, the uh, ME1 uh, uh, abandoned at the uh, transcri transcription activity region. And uh, in contrast, the ME3 modification occur uh, at the region that uh, uh, um, exhibit transcription uh, suppression region. So then we would like to know what caused this, uh, uh, what's the uh, molecular, uh, fundamental molecular property that, uh, uh, that determines that uh, uh, those modifications occur at different uh, uh, gene regions. So therefore we use uh, uh, chemical reactions to install the analog of those modifications into histone H4. And then we use this H4 to reconstitute into uh, uh, nucleosome arrays and look at the uh, molecular property of this system. So um, the, uh, for, for the N-terminal tails using the g coupled experiment, we can say that for the uh, nucleosome arrays that harbored uh, ME1 uh, modification, uh, the tail has one distinct conformation uh, and on the other hand, the ME3 modification, the TL region uh, exhibits two uh, distinct conformation. Um, so this means that the uh, um, ME1 actually leads to a more flexible TLs. So therefore you have a, a more uh, have highly dynamic region, uh, N-terminal TLs, uh, which only gives one average conformation. And, uh, on the other hand, ME3 leads to uh, relative more rigid tails, which uh, we can uh, observe uh, distinctive conformation uh, for the tails. And we also look at, looked at the uh, globular domain for the nucleosome that harbor these two different uh, uh, modifications. And overall, the structure doesn't have much uh, uh, changes uh, instead, we do notice that there's a dynamics difference 
for this uh, uh, two system uh, uh, for this uh, for instance uh, here I shows the a few highlight a few regions uh, from the uh, peak intensities in the dipolar based experiment we can say that the globular domain of the uh, uh, nucleus zone having the me1 are more dynamic uh, compared to the me3 so combining our uh, uh, other bio Physical study, including AOC and participate, uh, participation uh, participate assays, we show that uh, ME1 actually leads to a more uh, dynamic uh, dynamic uh, uh, structure of uh, uh, nucleosome arrays. Uh, in contrast, ME3 leads to a more compact, less dynamic nucleosome uh, structure. Uh, so, because of those molecular property. Uh, difference actually uh, leads to different uh, uh, DNA accessibility, therefore leads to either promote or suppress the transcription. So it's a very uh, nice piece of work that uh, uh, shows the uh, uh, fundamental of how those uh, uh, PDM works. Um, so with that, I would like to thank all the colleagues and the collaborators uh, uh, for working together on those exciting projects. And uh, thanks for the uh, our uh, Singapore MOE and uh, NTO to uh, support financially support our work. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, so before we head to the breakout rooms, we have our last speaker. Uh, Julian. Okay. Do we see it in full? Yes. Okay, very nice. So, uh, so good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. And also thank you for organizing this uh, beautiful webinar. And uh, I just left Switzerland a few weeks ago to establish my lab now in, in Austria. So uh, it's quite an exciting time uh, for us. And uh, I'd like to talk about. Um, okay, just put the laser pointer on. Okay, I'd like to talk about the new methods that we recently developed, uh, the so-called NMR molecular replacement methods. And these methods is actually uh, the goal of that method is basically to 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 do exactly what it, uh, this picture shows to go from actually a free ligand in solution and to derive to calculate the structure of the ligand protein complex without having the need to, to assign the protein and, 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 and to, to lose a lot of time on that process. So this process actually has to be very fast. So I think the uh, uh, application of that is, is obvious. I mean, it could be also a chemical biology, but it's also obviously structure-based drug designs. Huh? It's, you know, in structure-based drug design, you actually need to, to optimize. You have this circle of optimization uh, where you basically want to uh, 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 get the better molecule possible, and at some point you have to get the structure. And this is actually done by X-ray. And NMR is unfortunately too slow to get this uh, information because I think the whole cycle has to be done within a few days, maybe one or two weeks. And NMR usually takes several weeks, if not months or, or more, to get the structure of a complex. Well, X-ray actually are fast, and the reason why they are fast is the following: they have the molecular replacement methods. And this is nothing else than actually combining experimental data with uh, a previously known structure from the PDB. If you combine these two, you can actually get derived the, the structure of a complex. And this is fast and established in automatics, and that's why they have 10 times more structure in the PDB compared to NMR. Well, I mean, we wanted to do the same. And, uh, um, you know, the, the, the most famous experimental methods uh, in NMR is the NOE. So we actually collect NOE data. Then we look in the PDB. Uh, for a homology uh, protein, homologous protein structure. And then on the top of that, we have to add the bioactive conformation of the ligand. And if you combine these three information, the NMR2 and the uh, molecular replacement methods by NMR will actually provide you the structure of the complex. So in the talk, I will explain you how we do that and show you some example. I'm very happy that people started to pick it up and to also see the, the potential of the methods. So here, just recall what's the goal. The goal is really to go from, from, from a free ligand to the, the bound structure and the bound structure of the ligand in the binding site of the protein without having to investigate basically in anything on the protein. So no uh, protein assignment, no side chain assignment and so forth. So this is actually quite ambitious. It's actually also uh, uh, quite ambitious because we would like to be fast 
So it has to be simple and easy and fast, which is normally not the case in NMR. And we also don't want to do any docking. So there is no docking protocol. So it's 100% structure calculation driven uh, uh, process. Um, so, the, the, so what we need to have, as I said, is the bound conformation of the ligand. We also need to have a receptor model. That's what we get from the PDB and we discuss. We will discuss in the slides about uh, how accurate uh, they have to be. The bound conformation, this is something you get from transfer NOE. So this is quite, quite established and relatively simple for small molecules. So that is basically the two requirements we need to have. And <clears throat> so here you see in the pictures of what what is now explain the principle of the methods. This is basically what you would have at the end. You have a, a ligand uh, uh, in the binding site. So here's a peptide and the binding site is depicted in green. And then, and then you have uh, this golden sphere that represent the uh, protons of the protein. So it works actually uh, with different uh, groups uh, from the protein, but it works best with methyl groups. So let's assume for the moment we only have methyl, but we did the methods with aromatics and amide groups as well. So as I said, we don't have the assignment of the protein. So we are basically have only question mark on these, on these uh, uh, atoms. But what we can measure is the NOEs, and that you can always measure, and the intermolecular NOEs between the protein and the ligand. And so that basically you have a network of distances between the protein and the ligand. And that's basically all the information we have on the top of having a structure, a structure that is actually not the right one, but from the PDB. On, close or, or far actually from the true structure. And on the methods is basically the following. The, the, the whole goal is the following, is to take the ligand conformation, the ligand structure, to find a way to, uh, to, to retrieve the binding site location on the surface of the protein. If you don't have, if you have the binding site, then fine, but if you don't have it, you will also find it. And then uh, find the right orientation of the ligand in the binding pocket. So once you have done that, basically you have done solve the structure. And this is working the, with the following ideas, there's nothing else on a GPS. <clears throat> and um, uh, I mean, you see on the picture, these uh, satellites that basically send signal to these gentlemen <clears throat> to derive the location of these gentlemen, you just need to have enough uh, distance information. So if you have enough distance information that we have now here on the NOE's network, then you can reconstruct the, the complex. Yeah, in our case, we have no information about the assignment, so we have to try out all possible combinations. And this combination number is actually not so high because we can rule them out based on NOE distances. Yeah. So let's benchmark that. And I said the receptor model is actually quite important. And how important is that? So we try to benchmark that uh, 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 methods on the following uh, protein. So HGM2 and HGMX, they don't regulate, so they regulate P53, that is the tumor suppressor. So basically they're involved in a lot of cancers uh, uh, um, um, uh, because if, if P53 is actually uh, uh, knocked out or downregulated, basically the, the cells becomes immortal and then it triggers cancers. So they, they uh, solved the structure of this uh, complex that was actually uh, done in 2010 by extra uh, crystallography. And you see that the binding site is actually huge. You have three epitopes, the filling, alanine, tryptophan, and leucine that actually binds in a very large pocket. So let's uh, apply the NMR2 on that system and see uh, how important is the, the protein structure. So we first have to measure NOEs. And uh, what we do, we measure intermolecular NOEs. So we filter out uh, most of the protein signals and only keep the one that connect the ligand and the protein. So we have ligand protein interaction. We also have in that spectral ligand ligand interaction. So in that spectral, it's nearly empty, except for a few peaks that you can see here. For example, that's a snapshot between the ligand where you have the uh, in the indirect dimension, the, the, the ligand and in the direct dimension, you have the protein. So you are in the region between zero and two PPM. So those, those are the metal uh, regions. And you see that you can measure the intensity of this nosy peak. So intermolecular uh, NOEs. And if you do that at different mixing time, you get these beautiful uh, build-up curves on the lower uh, panel of the, uh, uh, the slides. And from these uh, build-up curves on the decay of the diagonal, you can actually drive quite accurate distances. Now we have uh, the assignment of the ligand, the, the peptide that is now uh, here in pink in the middle. We have our methyl connections we don't know, so we call them M1 to M9. And then you have distances. And this network of distances is all what we need to derive the the structure of the complex. So what if uh, the receptor is actually perfect? We have the ligand, we just need to find again the structure. And of course, this is, uh, it has to work, otherwise uh, method will be useless. So here, uh, our prediction is in orange. You see on the left, uh, orange prediction from NMR2 versus the green structures 
of the X-ray. And there is no difference at all. So we have a beautiful accuracy. Uh, the calculation took a few minutes only to run. And this is uh, using uh, only about uh, 20 anomalies, intermolecular anomalies. So if, if it's a little bit more complex, that would be the perfect molecular replacement example. You have the protein in complex with a different ligand, the ligand that you don't want actually to have. So you would like to have derivatives of that ligand. And you have to remove the ligand from the binding site and use this protein structure as a reference one and try to calculate the complex. And it works again. So this is actually quite, quite strong. It works again it, it, beautifully. The, the, the three epitopes here are overlapping very well. More complicated is in the PDB, you don't have the right uh, protein, but just homologous protein. And you have to do exactly the same as before, uh, but do the homology modeling. <clears throat> this is again, uh, working very fine. So our prediction by the NMR2, start to calculation orange, then you have a perfect overlap also on the three epitopes. On the other side, of the ligands, this is towards the solvents, this is actually more flexible, so it's less important. But the three major epitopes here are very overlapping perfectly, and this is good for MedCam. Now, this is not really meant for that, but this is actually the more complicated uh, 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 case when you don't see even the binding site. So you have no protein in the PDB, just a homology model. It's, model is actually not showing any binding pockets. So then you have these so-called cryptic pockets. And then you have to detect that, and that you can see by NMR. So if you measure HSQC, you see that you have completely different uh, uh, spectra. One is actually in a conformational exchange, and you have line broadening, the pixel disappearing. This is on the red one, and when you add the ligand, everything is, is, is uh, popping up. So it suggests that you have large uh, motions uh, in, in, uh, that you, that you uh, 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 trigger. Uh, that you fix when the ligand is binding. So then you have to give flexibility on the receptor. This is what we did. Of course, here now the calculation uh, uh, shoot up. The time experimental uh, uh, calculation time is, is going to a few days, but still we can get the right, uh, uh, the right uh, uh, binding uh, structure, the right binding mode of the ligand and the right binding pocket and so forth. So actually independently of the receptor structure, we could get uh, always the right uh, uh, structure. But that was you now benchmarking on the structures. So I think on the protein structure, it's not so sensitive. So this is actually great. So we said, okay, maybe we have something great here. We can move forward. Let's try to, 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 to apply the methods on different ligand. And now we, we went from pe peptide or peptidomimetic with high affinity to something with micromolar affinity on a drug-like molecule. With 14 anomalies, this was also working very nicely. So we could uh, compare our prediction with the extra data and you see that the, 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 the rings that here that connect to the proteins are also very well placed. Of course, you always have something that is to, uh, pointing toward the solvent that is flexible, which you should just ignore, but the rest is actually uh, perfectly overlapping. Then we go for uh, the other example, not clean on the co left corner down, with 14 nanomolar affinity, 16 anomalies that was also working so far. The last example with five millimolar uh, of this ligand that basically is a weak binder, so we could not crystallize that, so we compare our uh, structure, the right structure in orange in NMR2 um, with the excess structure of Natlin, and we see that the binding uh, structure activity might make sense. So we could we could confirm that here, but we, we have no other benchmark. But overall, we, we are quite confident that this method is actually quite widely applicable from small molecule, peptide, peptidomimetics, and different affinity range. So we moved forward on different system with collaborators. And we had a uh, first collaboration with uh, Monash University where they actually work on this DSPA protein that is a target for <clears throat> antibiotics. And they had this molecule that binds with one millimolar affinity to this protein. And they had uh, done everything. So the structure, the assignment of the protein and everything. And they sent us only uh, experimental NOE data without assignment on the protein side. And we found uh, the, 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 the complex structure here in, in blue. So that's our uh, uh, prediction with NMR2. They have found the one in purple, while the actual people have found something completely different. So here we are quite confident that NMR2 is also reproducing what the other NMR methods would, would, would create. So that was quite nice. We only had 25 uh, NOEs here. So uh, moving forward, uh, collaboration with AstraZeneca on Bromo domains. This is no nanomolar binders, also drug-like molecule. And I just mentioned a few things that are really highlighting the, the work here. So uh, if you compare our structure by NMR2 with respect to the one you could find on X-ray, you would see that you have completely different loop motion. So on the top right, you see the extra structure in orange 
the NMR2 structure in, in blue, and we measure NOEs that are about five angstrom, while in extra structure, they would be about 11 angstrom. So this is something we could detect easily, like NMR would do. Uh, the NMR molecular replacement would also uh, pick up motions. Yeah? And then uh, on the last example, BRD4, BD2, a nanomolar affinity binders, then you see here a snapshot of the intermolecular uh, region. So in the field gnosis experiment, you see you have beautiful cross peak, but you also see somewhere that there are no peak at all. And this is basically no NOEs. And this is something that the people don't really use normally in normal structure calculation, but we make use of that. And we call that anti-NOEs. That, that, that was already uh, discovered or used uh, in the past by Van Gusteren and the people from, from Holland, so Captain and, and Berlin, where they use that uh, type of restraint. So we kind of reuse them here in for our purpose. And this adds extra information in the structure calculation protocol. It works beautifully, beautifully fine and helps quite a lot the, uh, the, the, the protocol. The last example there is uh, uh, on fragment with our analysis. So I think I've shown you a lot of example now, uh, except for fragments. So fragments are difficult because they are small. And uh, if on the top of that, the body is a very large pocket, this is now pin one and the pocket is here on the, on, 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 in the middle, as you can see, is quite large with respect to the fragment size. And uh, this makes the whole process more difficult. So, uh, so these are the three fragments we were using to benchmark our methods here. You see the affinity goes for a few hundred micromolar to millimolar, which is expected for fragments. And they are uh, nearly the same, except for these groups. Here you have a metal and chloride and CF3. So you derive the affinity with different methods, but also with CSPs. And uh, we have weak binders uh, for sure. So we measure the intermolecular NOEs, so the filter noses, and we have similar peak pattern here. So as, again, we don't have the assignment of the metal, so we call them M1 to M5. So we have the NOE network. The NOE network is quite different from the ligand. Of course, if you have metal groups, you have more NOEs. But from, from overall, if you already look at the noses spectra, you can say that you have a similar binding mode because you have the similar peak patterns. And if you do the structure calculation with NMR2, uh, altogether, you actually get the, the, the structure of the complex. And again, you see that you have a similar uh, binding mode. Yeah. So um, just to summarize, I've shown you that this uh, method works from 10 kilodalton to more than 20, 25 kilodalton on the protein side. We try to, to get larger now uh, by uh, uh, different labeling schemes. Um, this is quite encouraging. So I think the, the drug design by NMR is probably will benefit from that method a lot. So we also uh, tried out different uh, ligands, all possible ligands from fragments to peptide, peptidomimetic, drug-like, non-drug-like molecule, ranging from nanomolar to millimolar affinity. So I think we covered nearly all possible configuration. If you want to have more detail about the methods, please look at this, this paper. Okay, last uh, two slides and then I'm done. Um, uh, um, I want to introduce something really, really cool. So I think the NMR molecular replacement method is really for structure-based drug design, high throughput. And this is now a new ID uh, I would like to introduce. So it's, it's about thermodynamics at atomic resolution. So you may know that uh, Beat and Roland and myself uh, between uh, uh, 2010 or a bit before and, and recently uh, uh, with Peter Günther and the whole group of Roland Rieck at the ETH Zurich, we have developed these uh, exact NOEs. And this exact NOEs is basically nothing else than measuring a distance with high accuracy and a high precision. So now we have 0.1 angstrom accuracy and it's highly accurate. So if you have that on a protein, you can detect motions uh, of the protein. When, uh, what I want to do with this type of data, it's not different, is to detect uh, or to measure thermodynamics uh, 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 instead of getting the, the motions of the protein. So it's just a, a different way of looking at it. So if I measure this exactly now, it's a different temperature, I can actually access thermodynamic parameters. And you can, the similar way you have this network that now reflect uh, energies uh, on the protein. I think this is very preliminary, so I just want to introduce the idea here. And uh, uh, I think we are quite excited because you can imagine well, the wealth of information you have from this type of, of, of measurement. With that, I'd like to thank the people involved in the work uh, from ETH, which I left, and uh, all colleagues also that are now in a different uh, continent, uh, collaborators from different universities as well. 
Um, of course, uh, we had some uh, crystallography work. So the PSI in Switzerland, uh, Goethe University in Frankfurt, the companies that have been uh, willing to collaborate on different projects. And I also like to thank the people now helping to build the lab at the moment. So we have Nicola Marie Rose in Vienna, Pharma Pharmaceutical Science Institute. And we get reinforcement soon uh, uh, to, to create uh, our lab, the biochemistry. So we built uh, everything from scratch, which is also quite nice. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention.